Well, welcome once again, class, uh, to Social Ethics. Today what we're going to do is we're going to begin talking about some basic terminology and concepts that we're going to be using for the entire semester. Uh, we're going to spend today's class and then the next two just going over some preliminary kind of information. Philosophy, as I've previously said, is not something that most people take growing up, and so when they get to a class like this, they're very unfamiliar with some of the terms and categories that we use to discuss things. Even though I, I do think that people have a, some kind of natural abilities where they can think through arguments and they can think through various uh, claims that people make, they just sometimes lack the terms to talk about these. But as you, you're, I'm sure, aware, having the terminology to discuss things often helps facilitate conversation. Uh, imagine, for instance, you know, if you say to someone, hey, go get me that thing in the other room. You know, that can be really confusing, and you don't know what the person is talking about. But if you say, hey, go get me uh, the ratchet on the floor, well, that just helps conversation go along a lot better if you just have the particular name to discuss things. And so what we're going to be doing, as I said, is just giving terms to some concepts and categories that um, maybe you do have in place or maybe you're completely unfamiliar to you. And what we're going to be discussing quite a, a lot in this class all semester long is we're going to be talking about what people believe and we're going to be evaluating people's beliefs. And so to this end, it's good, I think, to begin with just a definition in place of what it is we are talking about when we talk about what people believe. Now, when you hear the word belief, you may think of a lot of different things. Uh, in my face-to-face -face classes, I'll typically pause at this moment and ask students just to define what the word belief means. And quite often what I discover is that I'm met with a variety of different definitions. Some people will say, well, to believe something is to think something but not know it, or to believe something is to have faith in something else, or to believe something is just your own personal opinion. And right there, I just provided you three different definitions of the word belief. And since people do quite often have different definitions of what the word belief means, it can make conversation very, very tricky. Um, people end up talking past one another. And so it's with this in mind that I want to offer a definition of the word belief that we're going to be using as we move forward. And the way that I'm going to define belief is I'm going to say that a belief is just to think that something is, uh, anything you think is true. To believe something is just to think that it is true. And I say this because I want to contrast belief between what we call a belief and something that's purely a personal opinion. And the difference between these is just this, is that a personal opinion is a type of belief. It's one particular kind of belief whose truth value depends on the person who holds it. So, for instance, if I tell you that cookies and cream ice cream is the best ice cream, I mean, that's just my opinion, and it's not something that you can dispute or you can argue with. You can't tell me I'm wrong. If I really do think cookies and cream is the best ice cream, that's just my opinion. But when we use belief, not all beliefs are just mere opinions. Some beliefs are beliefs of facts. So, for instance, it's perfectly normal to say, I believe that 1 plus 1 equals 2, or I believe that light travels at 186,000 miles per second, or I believe that Abe Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. These are all things that I believe because I think that they are true, um, but they're not just mere opinions. And so I know this might seem really, really simple, and hopefully it does, uh, then I don't have to do too much to convince you, but when we talk about beliefs and opinions, it's important to note up front that not all beliefs are just the same thing as talking about opinions. And one way to maybe help represent this uh, so that you can have a clear idea of what I'm talking about is if we look at it like this, is that personal opinions are going to be the kinds of things that we can't dispute or we can't uh, argue about. And they're one subset, one kind of belief that you might hold. But there are many, many other types of beliefs that you hold that are not just mere opinions. Uh, like I was saying, 
before. When we think about beliefs like, I believe that one plus one equals two, well, that's the kind of belief that's going to go in this larger sphere out here. But something like, I think cookies and cream ice cream is the best, that's going to go down here. And then there are going to be other beliefs uh, that I might hold. For instance, I might say that uh, Miley Cyrus is the greatest musician alive. Well, even though it's kind of ridiculous, uh, that still is my personal opinion. And so that's the kind of thing that would go in here. It'd be a one type of belief. I think it's true, but its truth really depends on me. But other kinds of beliefs, their truth doesn't depend on me. The truth depends on the way the world is. So instant, for instance, if I say, I believe that the world is getting warmer and that's primarily due to human activity. Well, that's a belief and that's something that goes over here. It, it would be something that we could dispute that would be true or false. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe the reason the, the earth is getting warmer is not due to human activity. Um, that's something that would go over here nonetheless, even if I, that's a false belief. So you see, some beliefs, like I said, they go in this category. We just A belief is anything you think is true, anything. Some beliefs are mere opinions, those kinds of things you can't be wrong about. But some beliefs go over here, and you can be wrong about them. And so I say this up front because we have to be very, very careful about how we use terms. If I was moving forward and I was just using belief, and I hadn't offered this distinction in place, you might think that by belief is just something that's mere opinion, but that's not true. Opinions are a type of belief that you hold. Now we're going to be evaluating beliefs throughout the class, things that people think are true. And one thing before we get to talking about uh, beliefs, I want to say this, is that our beliefs are very, very important to us. And you know, Sometimes I think people underestimate just how important beliefs are. And I want to say a couple of things to demonstrate this, but just think about this, for instance. Take a belief that someone has, for instance, that, uh, I don't know, Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. And someone might believe that, or someone might believe that uh, there is one God and Muhammad is his only prophet. You know, those kinds of things that people believe, they can shape everything about that person. They can determine how that person perceives the world, how that person sees uh, their uh, fate within uh, and their destiny within the universe, that one belief can define that person's sense of self or take a belief that people might have in the, in the value of personal freedom. I mean, we fought the Revolutionary War because, or our founding fathers fought it, I should say, because they believed in personal freedom so much and they thought that uh, their freedom was being encroached upon by the King of England. Uh, what you see before you right here is one of the most iconic images of the 20th century, and this took place in uh, Tiananmen Square, China, back in the late 80s. And what was going on is there were a series of student protests that were taking place because people in China were fed up with uh, so much uh, government involvement and government laws and restrictions, and people thought they deserved more freedoms. And so students were protesting, and what happened is the government of China decided to roll in tanks into this public uh, area in order to get people to leave. And this one person right here, he stood up to stop the tanks from coming in. And that person really was truly risking his life uh, standing up against the government. And why was he doing that? Well, because of a, of a belief he had about uh, fairness and freedom. And so I say all this uh, in order to demonstrate this point is that our beliefs matter. Um, they matter personally to us. They matter in terms of how we see ourselves and how we see our place in the universe. They matter to us in terms of the implications and consequences they have for other people. And so it's not something that we should be dismissive of when we start to evaluate and investigate beliefs, given the importance that they do have. I mean, again, take you know, the beliefs of someone like Adolf Hitler. I mean, those had a tremendous impact on uh, the world as we know it. Or beliefs that people had about uh, communism. Uh, Marx and Engels, they were just philosophers sitting around having conversations, and that turned into uh, various systems of government that have had a tremendous impact on the world as we see it. And so beliefs are really important. They have huge consequences for ourselves and for the world around us. And for this reason, 
we might in encounter an important question about what things should we believe? Uh, what, what do we want out of our beliefs? I mean, because given how important they are, we shouldn't just be willy-nilly about them. We shouldn't just accept anything that comes our way. Uh, and with this in mind, I want to make a few suggestions about what kinds of beliefs that we should have. And one thing I think that most people want from their beliefs or want their beliefs to be like is people want true beliefs. And when I say true here, what I mean is they want their beliefs to mirror the way the world actually is. Uh, for instance, if you think, for instance, that the world is warming and this is due to human involvement, well, you want that belief to be true. You want it to actually be the case that the world is, in fact, warming and it is due to human activity. Uh, it, I think it's really, I don't know what the word is, maybe just perverse or maybe it's just uh, we, we recognize there's something disreputable about someone who believes something and you, you show them evidence that their belief is false and they're unwilling to budge on that. We recognize that there's something that's valuable and important about truth. It's important to have beliefs that really mirror and match up with the way that the world is. Uh, and this is one of, our, I think, of our cognitive goals. We want to have as many true beliefs as we can and minimize the number of false beliefs. Uh, it would just be, I've never met anyone who said something like, well, you know, I believe a lot of true things, but it'd be nice to throw in a few false beliefs just to, uh, you know, have some balance there. I mean, that seems kind of weird. We want to avoid falsity at all costs, and we want to maximize the number of true beliefs that we have. I love this quote right here. This is from Gandhi, and he said, there is no higher God than truth. And I think we recognize that there is something valuable and important about truth. But in addition to having true beliefs, I think we want something more for our beliefs, and that is that we want to have evidence or reason, what we might say is justification for our beliefs, because we recognize that just having true beliefs is not, is not always acceptable. For instance, imagine you're taking a multiple choice test, and you get to question number 25, and you don't know the answer, so what do you do? Uh, most people, they see their way out of it, right? You just guess C. And suppose that you guess C on this multiple choice test and it came back and C was correct. Well, guess what? In that case, you believe C was the right answer. Maybe you really convinced yourself that C was the right answer. You believe C was right and it turns out it's true that C was right. But it seems something off about your answer there because we would say you didn't know it. You didn't actually know it. Why? Because you just got lucky and you guessed. And so what we want for our beliefs is not just to get lucky and happen to have true beliefs, but we also want to have evidence or reason, uh, justification to support those. And when I talk about evidence or reason, I don't necessarily mean like you have to have you know, scientific charts or data or anything like that. Uh, evidence or reason can, uh, can take place in various kinds of forms, uh, but basically any kind of justification that you might have to support your belief. We want good uh, evidence to support beliefs. And when we think about justification, what I have in mind here is something like this. What justification does is it holds up or supports a particular belief that you happen to have. So look right here, and the way I think about it is kind of like your evidence forms the foundation and structure of a house, and your belief would be kind of like the roof of your house. And so what your evidence does is it basically it holds up or it supports the, the roof of your house. And so right here, he would be a kind of evidence. Pete's DNA was on the murder weapon, therefore Pete killed Sam. And you see, this is our evidence that's holding up or supporting this. Uh, this right here, this picture isn't really telling you anything that wasn't on the previous slide, but basically it's just giving you some kind of visual representation of exactly what it is I'm talking about. Your evidence holds up, it supports, it props up the beliefs that you might have. Now, we believe all kinds of things, and many of these beliefs we just keep to ourselves. We never share with the world, you know, you just think it. Uh, you, you probably have had this experience where you go on Facebook and somebody posts something that's just really dumb and so you start typing and you're like, I'm going to give this person a piece of my mind and then you think, wait, I don't have all day to spend agonizing with this person over this stupid Facebook post so then you just delete it. Well, uh, in that case, you believe it. You're thinking, this person's an idiot. 
but you don't actually say it. When you actually make a uh, statement and you declare to the world what your belief is, let's say you type out that comment and then you hit enter. Well, in that case, then you've not just, you don't just believe something, but you've made a claim. And to make a claim is just to state that something is either true or false. And the big difference, I suppose, between a belief and a claim is just the fact that claims are express beliefs. And, and this is pretty straightforward, but I want to point out something that's important here, is that not every single sentence that someone expresses necessarily provides us with a claim. Not all sentences express claims. Uh, a claim is an expression of a belief. And remember, beliefs are the kinds of things that can be true or false. Likewise, we could say with claims, since they're expressing beliefs, they too can be true or false. But notice that many sentences in the English language don't express things that are true or false. For instance, if I say to you, don't sit there, that's not something you'd say back to me. You'd say, false. That wouldn't make any sense. If I say, don't sit there, you just say, I'll sit here if I want, or okay, but you don't say true or false. Uh, so this isn't an expression of a claim because claims are true or false. They're one or the other. Uh, who are you going with? If I asked you, who are you going with? And you said, true, back to me. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. Uh, this is a question. Uh, and questions aren't true or false. Uh, claims are true or false. Or if I say, hello, and you say, false, back to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. A greeting is not something that is true or false. Claims are things that are true or false. So hopefully all of that is fairly clear. So far, I think these um, distinctions are, are more or less straightforward. Uh, the one point I do want to make here, though, is claims are, are things that are true or false, and not all sentences necessarily are. Now, if you provide a claim and you offer no justification for that claim whatsoever, then you're making what we call an assertion. An assertion is a claim offered with no justification. On the other hand, if you offer some reason, and it doesn't have to be very good, but any kind of reason whatsoever to think that a particular claim is actually true, then you have provided what we call an argument. And we're going to be using the word argument in a very technical kind of way. Quite often when people hear the word argument, what they think of is someone bickering or someone yelling at each other. For instance, you, you might have heard someone say, wow, did you see that couple getting in a fight in the parking lot? They were having a heated argument. Well, that's not what we're going to mean when we use the word argument. An argument is not yelling back and forth. An argument, as we're using the term, is just to offer a claim and provide some evidence, some justification to think that is actually true, that claim is true. And like I said, in order to qualify as an argument, you don't have to have necessarily good justification. Even really, really weak justification would still be the difference between something that's a mere assertion and something that is an argument. Now, I want to provide a few examples of this just so you can see the difference here. But take a claim like this. Steroid testing should be mandatory in Major League Baseball. Well, that's a claim. Uh, it's, an, it's a particular kind of claim. It's an assertion. And the reason it's an assertion is because I provided no evidence to think that's true. I mean, even if that seems obvious that steroid testing should be mandatory, that's not an argument. The difference here, uh, in order to make it an argument, would be to provide some level of evidence to think that this is true. So if I said something like this, steroid testing should be mandatory in Major League Baseball because players who use steroids have an unfair advantage. Notice now that I've actually provided an argument. And the reason I have provided an argument is because I've given you some reason to think that this is true. Uh, I've given, and here's my reason right here, uh, here's my reason right here, is I've said that players who use steroids have an unfair advantage. And, and that right there is providing you reason to think that this claim up here is actually true. Now here's another example. If I said abortion should be legal, right? Maybe you think that's true. Maybe that seems obvious to you. But as it stands, you're not given any reason to think that this is the case. And so you're just providing an assertion. You're not providing any level of argumentation. 
Now, there are a lot of different arguments that people make in order to try to show that abortion should be legal. I you know, have limited space up here, so you have to f forgive the crudeness of the following argument, but here it goes. Abortion should be legal, otherwise women will resort to back alley abortions. Now, right here, what I've done is I've made this claim, abortion should be legal, um, and then I provided you a reason. Otherwise, women will resort to back alley abortions. And for those who are unfamiliar with what this means, it's basically just women will have to go to uh, doctors who don't practice uh, medicine in safe and sanitary conditions. And so there's an argument that's being made. Now, I don't think this is a particularly good argument. I think there are much better arguments, but this is an argument nonetheless. Why? Because you provide your claim, and then you offer a reason right here to think that it's true. Now, I have one final example, and I have to confess this one's really silly, but here it goes. Pimping ain't easy. All right, so this is a claim. Pimping ain't easy. Now, some of you might think this is obviously true, uh, but technically it could be false. This is a claim. Uh, someone could argue and say, well, no, I actually, you know, I, I disagree. I think it's, it's kind of difficult, right? Maybe this is the kind of thing uh, that uh, people dispute. Uh, but this is a claim nonetheless, and it's, and it's not an argument. Now, to make it into an argument, you'd have to give a reason uh, to think that this is actually true. And so here it goes. And forgive me once again for the stupidity of what I'm about to say, but here it goes. Um, Pimping ain't easy because fools are always trying to steal your flavor. All right. So I heard this in a movie once. Just work with me here. So anyway, uh, this is an argument. You've got a claim that's being made. And then you have a reason to think that this is true. And that's really the difference between an argument and an assertion. An argument is a claim offered with some evidence. Even if it's silly, uh, as long as you're trying to give a reason to think something is true, then you've offered an argument nonetheless. So we were just describing what an argument is. And we can further diagram what an argument is, and we can distinguish its various parts. And all arguments consist of premises or a premise uh, and a conclusion. And we represent them like this. You see right here, a premise is going to be, what a premise is, is basically it's an individual unit of thought that helps lead to and support the conclusion. Um, your premises taken together, as I have marked right here, these provide your evidence, your reason, or your justification. Evidence, reason, justification, I'm using all of these uh, interchangeably. Uh, and here's an example of an argument, one we just saw. Major league players who use steroids have an unfair advantage. Premise, conclusion, therefore steroid testing should be mandatory. And when we construct arguments, an argument can consist of at least a single premise and a one conclusion, or an argument can have many, many premises, as many as you want, I suppose, and an argument doesn't necessarily have to have one conclusion. Some arguments draw multiple conclusions, but at the very minimum, it has to have at least one premise and one conclusion. Here's another example. So premise one, denying same-sex couples marital rights while granting those rights to heterosexual couples is not fair treatment under the law. Premise two, the law should be fair. Conclusion, therefore same-sex couples should be granted the same legal rights as heterosexual couples. Now, you may disagree with this argument, and you may be looking at it and saying, well, look, there's more things to consider here, and there are problems with your argument, and that's all well and good, and I'm not here to dispute that. But what I want to show you here is just the structure of an argument, premise, premise, conclusion. And all arguments that we're going to look at this semester are going to be placed in this kind of form that you see right here. We're going to list the premises, and then we're going to list the conclusion uh, at the end. So hopefully that is fairly clear when we talk about the difference or what an argument is and the various parts of an argument. It's also important to understand what an argument is, is that we distinguish arguments from explanations. And the big difference between arguments and explanations is that arguments try to give you a reason to think that something is true, whereas explanations, they don't try to give you a reason to think that something is true. Rather, what explanations do is they tell you how or why something has taken place. 
Explanations tend to be of either an historical or causal nature. Oftentimes, they're both. And so here are some examples of explanations. Uh, you might say the building was destroyed because the tornado hit it. Notice right here this language. What I'm saying is, is causal because the tornado hit it. And I'm explaining what, what caused the building to be destroyed. Well, this took place in the past. This tornado occurred and it caused this uh, building to be destroyed. Or the Civil War ended because Lee surrendered. Again, we're taking this historical event. The Civil War ended. Why? What's the causal history? Well, Lee surrendered. Obama is president because he received more electoral votes. Again, I'm explaining. I'm providing a history uh, and telling a causal story that took place that explains this event of Obama becoming president. Uh, the metal expanded because it was heated. Again, I'm taking this event, the metal expansion, uh, and I'm giving an explanation of this in virtue of this history or this causal event that came before it. And these examples, I think, are fairly clear. It's like, okay, yeah, you're explaining uh, these particular events that have taken place. But sometimes arguments and expl explanations can be easily confused with one another. And I think there are a, a couple of reasons that this can take place. And on the one hand, I think this is hard to distinguish them because we use the same language when we talk about arguments and explanations. On a, uh, well, like, for instance, you might say, what's the reason, I'll go back a slide here, what's the reason the building was destroyed? All right? And that sounds very similar when I'm saying, well, what's the reason you believe that uh, Major League Baseball should have um, mandatory steroid testing? Notice I'm using that language. What's the reason uh, that, that something happened? Or what's the reason that I should believe that? So that language is very similar uh, that we see in uh, arguments and explanations. Not only that, but sometimes we can represent them, or actually we can always represent them in similar structural ways. So look at this right here. This is an explanation. The tornado hit the building, therefore the building was destroyed. And then look at this. Um, major league players who use steroids have an unfair advantage, therefore steroid testing should be mandatory. I mean, the language here and the way that we represent these are very, very similar. And if you're just looking at it, you might say, wait, is this an argument or is this an argument? What's what's going on here? I mean, this this way of presenting the information is structurally similar uh, the between the explanation and the argument itself. So oftentimes these two are tricky to distinguish. And so I want to give you a few tips to help you along uh, and better doing this. And one important difference, and I've already said this, is that explanations do not attempt to justify or give evidence for beliefs, whereas arguments do. Uh, arguments are trying to, to give you a reason to think that something is true. Along these same lines, you might think of this in this way, is just to say that arguments attempt to convince, whereas explanations attempt to clarify. And so, uh, you know, if I say something like the tornado uh, or the building was destroyed because the tornado hit it. I'm not trying to convince you that the building was destroyed. Uh, I, what I'm trying to do is just help clarify why did this take place. Whenever you think about one of the differences between arguments and explanations, what I always try to do, if there's ever any confusion, I just ask myself, is this person who's offering this, are they trying to convince me of what they're saying, or are they just providing a possible understanding of what is going on? And if they're trying to convince me, that's an argument. If they're just providing a possible understanding of what's going on, then that's an explanation. Uh, something else, and this is really important too, is that explanations are typically given for things that are uncontroversial, whereas arguments are typically given for claims that are controversial. Uh, think about all the examples I gave previously when I was talking about uh, you know, the building was destroyed because the tornado hit it, or the Civil War ended because Lee surrendered, or Obama is president because he received more electoral votes. Notice in each of those examples what is being explained, either Obama's presidency or uh, the Civil War ending. Uh, those things are not, we don't disagree on those things. Uh, we accept that these events have taken place, and now we're trying to understand them. That's what we do with explanations. But with arguments, on the other hand, we take a claim that is itself controversial 
And then we're trying to give you a reason uh, to believe what I believe or to believe something different than what you believe. Uh, and so this is another way, another kind of question you can pose to yourself and say, if you're ever in doubt about whether something's an argument or an ex explanation, you can say, wait, is the claim being made here, is this controversial? Well, if it is, then it's probably an argument. If it's uncontroversial, then it's probably an explanation. And finally, uh, and this is really, really important, what underlies all of this is that the difference between an argument and an explanation, at the end of the day, it really boils down to the intent of the person who's giving it. And the truth is, is that something could be an argument in one context and be an explanation in an entirely different context altogether. Uh, you know, it's hard to think of like a, a really simple example. Most of the examples of this are very, very complex. Uh, and so you have to forgive me for uh, the oversimplicity of what I'm about to say, but take something like this. God exists because my mom told me so, right? Well, is that an argument or an explanation? And you might be thinking, well, that's obviously an explanation. And it seems like it because if someone says, hey, you know, God exists, you know, my mom brought me up to believe this and she, she told me this and this is why I happen to believe that God exists. Seems like an explanation. What you're doing is you're, you're providing a kind of historical or causal account of how you came to have the belief that you do. However, in other contexts, this could be an argument. And you might imagine, for instance, uh, like maybe like small children talking to one another and one child says to another child says hey look I know God exists my mom told me so and she wouldn't lie now for adults that's probably not going to be a terribly convincing argument but for a small child that could be an argument because what he's doing or she's doing is relying on the mother as a source of authority to speak to the question of whether or not God exists uh, like I said, most examples where you see how um, what could be an argument in one context and an explanation in a different are a little more sophisticated than this. But what I'm trying to do with this simple example is just show you how, depending on the intention of the person who's uh, talking, that could affect whether something is an argument or it could affect whether it becomes uh, an, an explanation. And so this is going to be a question that we always have to ask. Like, what is this person who's saying this? What are they really trying to do? Are they trying to explain or are they trying to convince me uh, of something? All right, what I want you to do now is I want you to um, look at this right here and I want you to pause the lecture for a few minutes and I want you to go through and try to answer each one of these. Just write it down on a piece of paper or you can do it mentally, you don't have to write it down. But I want you to pause it and try to determine is this claim, uh, or is it a claim, is it uh, an argument, is it an explanation, is it an assertion, or is it none of the above? And, and just take a few minutes, pause this, and think, and try to answer these. Uh, don't just go ahead and skip and look at all the answers and be done for today. This is going to be really important. On your first quiz, in fact, I'm going to give you some examples like this, and you're going to have to identify if it's an argument or an explanation or an assertion. Uh, so you do need to you know, take this seriously and try to understand what's going on here. So pause it, answer these, and then restart it, and we'll talk about the answers. So hopefully you did what I said uh, to do, you paused it, and, and uh, now we're going to go through these, and I'm going to provide you the answers. So beginning with number one, my car stopped because I didn't put enough gas in the tank. And this, hopefully you said, is an explanation. Uh, we're taking some event that took place, my car stopped, and I'm giving you a historical causal account of why this occurred, because I didn't put enough gas in the tank. All right, number two, the best way to allow evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And this would be an assertion. Uh, this is a claim that is being made. It's, you, you might have thought it's an explanation because you might, be, you might have thought, well, uh, you know, what the person is explaining is, is how to allow evil to triumph. And then they're pointing to this right here for good men to do nothing. Uh, but really and truly, one rep, I mean, num number two right here represents a complete thought. 
It's saying the best way to allow evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And this is, as it stands, is just an assertion. It's not giving you any reason to think it's true, but it is something that could be true or false. Uh, and for that reason, it, it is actually an assertion. Remember, an assertion is a kind of claim. Claims are things that can be true or false. So by that reasoning, assertions are the kinds of things that can be true or false as well. Number three, since a man can't make a baby, he has no right to tell a woman when and where to create one. This is from Tupac's song, Keep Your Head Up. Uh, but this is actually an argument. And what he's claiming here, or what he's arguing, I should say, is he's saying, he's drawing a conclusion. Uh, a, ma uh, a man can't tell a woman when and where to create a baby. Why? What's the reason? He can't make one. So his premise is a man can't make a baby. Conclusion. Therefore, he has no right to tell a woman when and where to create one. Now, I don't think this is a particularly strong argument. Uh, but give him some you know, slack here. It was one lyric in a song, so he couldn't exactly elaborate on the, the reasons and justifications for it. But nonetheless, this is not a terribly strong argument, but it is an argument nonetheless. Why? Because he gives you uh, a reason to think that um, something is true for this claim over here. Number four, marriage is a wonderful institution, but who would want to live in such an institution? And this is none of the above. Uh, now, you might think that the person here is asserting something, but he's not. He's asking a question. And remember, questions are not the kinds of things that can be true or false. He's insinuating that marriage is bad, but he's not actually making a statement. It's a, it's a question. And for that reason, it's not, it's not an argument. It's not an explanation. It's not an assertion. It's therefore none of the above. Number five. The Braves need more consistent pitching if they're going to win the National League East. And they also need a major miracle. But uh, this right here, it is an assertion. Um, you might think that this is an argument or you might think it's an explanation, but it's neither of these. Um, they're not... A they're forming, again, this is kind of similar to number two, but this is a complete thought. It's an if-then statement. It's saying if A, then B. And that in itself is not an argument, nor is it an explanation. Um, basically, what the person is just saying is, uh, you know, just to read it back to you, if, they're, if the Braves are going to win the National League East, they need more consistent pitching. But they've given you no reason to think this is true, and it's not clear what exactly this would be ex explaining either. Uh, as it stands, this is just an assertion. It's something that could be false, um, which is why it is a claim, because someone could say, no, that's not true. The Braves pitching is fine. They can't hit and they can't run. That's the reason they're going to lose. So this is, this is a claim, but it's not providing you any reason to think this claim is actually true. Number six, hand me that cup of coffee. And this is none of the above. Uh, uh, this is just a command. And remember, commands are not the kinds of things that can be true or false. So the person who's saying this is not making a claim. Uh, they are just uttering a command, which is not true or false. And again, you can answer that. Hand me that cup of coffee. Would you say in response to them, true or false? No, you wouldn't say either of those. Finally, number seven. Censorship is wrong. Abridging any work is a form of censorship. Therefore, it is wrong to abridge Shakespeare. And this is an argument. Uh, and the conclusion here is you know, nicely laid out for you. Therefore, it is wrong to abridge Shakespeare. And it's two premises. Premise one, censorship is wrong. Premise two, abridging any work is a form of censorship. Conclusion, therefore, it is wrong to abridge Shakespeare. Now, if you didn't get all of these correct, do, don't worry too much about it. Um, right now, what's just important is, is that you have a, a general sense of the difference between an argument and an explanation. Uh, make sure that you keep in mind that an argument tries to convince, whereas an explanation attempts to clarify. And an assertion, by comparison, offers no reason to think that it's actually true or false.